this region. And quite often, we forget these things. And I tell you why we forget these things. Sometimes we remember these things, but they don't make sense to us because we haven't made the association. And if you haven't, because ignorance no longer will be bliss because you know. So it's, it's fascinating that we quite often don't make the association that if you learn violence, it gets transferred to your children and your children's children until somebody does something about it. And so we begin to learn something new and pass on new genes, huh? I had a major quarrel with uh, somebody, and we'll use an academic word, an idiot, recently. <laughs> That's an academic word. It means that you don't know fly. <laughs> but this person said to me, he doesn't understand the biological side of, of violence because violence is a social thing. May I inform you that we actually live in the 87% intersection between being an animal and a social being. As, as anthropologists on social violence, we actually know the percentage. 87% of what you see is what you get. You know, there's no species that is designed in a way in which you're fooled 100% of the time. Nor is there any species that gives you 100% of a homogeneous group. But we more talk about the murder rates and so forth for a single year, okay? We're interested in numbers like what happens in eight years, what happens in the five years, because that's kind of a generation or half a generation. You with me? And it's in a generation that things happen. So Honduras here at number eight is this absolutely beautiful picture in the midst of, I have to give you a few definitions. Dolan Sambans, 2000 and again in 2006, came up with a definition for a civil war, right? Listen very carefully. They came up with the idea that if there's armed conflicts, do you see arms and conflicts around you? Yeah. Yes, okay. By the way, there are no rules in here that, that says you can't respond, all right? <laughs> Just saying. So Dolan Sambani says you need to have armed conflict in which a thousand or more combatants are killed. And combatants have a specific definition. These are males between the age of 15, ages of 15 and 34, okay? Why do we use that age? Because between 15 and 34, most males go through an identity crisis. Then they are youth, and it's divided into two. 15 to 24, that's youth, and extended youth is 25 to 34. For those of us who work with gangs, by the time somebody gets to 35, if he's not the leader of a gang, he's already dead. Or he no longer sees the lumps. Mark, your sexual performance will fall too. But well, that's another story, right? As the testosterone falls, other hormones help you to reflect on life more, okay? That is why the age was created. So it's a biological, it's a, it's a neurobiological thing. So you're supposed to have at least a thousand combatants dying. The war represents a challenge to the sovereignty of a recognized state. I can tell you in Jamaica, when they went for Dados in, in 2010, they had a real war because people literally put up barricades. You know, it's quite funny. Incidentally, I actually was in Belize when that was happening and got very sick. The only time I've ever come to Belize and got sick because of hearing and seeing what is happening in my country. So it involves the state as one of the principal combatants and the rebels inflict significant casualties on the state. Now I had a problem with that when I was a student at the University of London, Soas, because we could work out in our heads what the heck would happen if a thousand people died in, a one, in one year in Belize or in St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, all of these small states. And so I was asked by my university, by my class, to set out on a journey to find a real civil war benchmark. And that meant including all the top 50 most violent states in the world and looking at those countries. And many of them were small, 
and most of them were colonized. You with me? Huh? Yeah. And when we checked, we found out that once your homicide rate exceeds 30 per 100,000, which was done in 2007, once your murder rate exceeds 30 per 100,000, you really are at war. Okay? Because at that point, there would be, the state itself would be having what? Casualties. In Jamaica, the homicide rate for the police force in Jamaica is literally 150 per 100,000 because they kill the police there. So we came up with that. Now, here is where a lot of people get it wrong. They look at the homicide rate for a country and they miss what's really happening because they genuinely think that the homicide rate for a country, that big average, is the only thing they need to know. Does anyone know the homicide rate for Mexico? It's less than 20. So Belize is listed as being far more valid than Mexico. And immediately, that clicks something in your head. It says to you, ah, size matters, right? Because Mexico has massive areas where the people there simply die of old age. The only thing they're scared of is old age. But when you're small, you don't have that luxury at all. In fact, 90% of children in Belize have seen a dead body compared to less than 20% in Mexico because you're small. Belize City basically is a delta, am I right? But you don't know that. It's just a delta. And everybody has to come here. Everyone has to come here. The other side of violence people seem not to understand is that it's about young men killing young men. But quite often, strategically and accidentally, women get killed. So if you want to find a country that is violent, if you want to know a country is violent, you look at the proportion of women who get killed. And this seems very oxymoronic, so listen very carefully. In first world countries, out of every 100 persons who are killed, more than a quarter are women. In a violent country, young men are killing young men so quickly with such high velocity that it never exceeds 10%. So Jamaica, which is the most violent country around here, has literally 9.4% of all persons killed are women. That doesn't mean the numbers are not big because the number overall is big. I'd rather be 25% of 10 than 9.4% of 100. You can see the difference. Can you see the difference? And so we have to watch these figures. Now I want to give you two lines. The green line at the base, that's the, let me see if you're getting it. That's the Civil War benchmark. It says 30, right? 30. The purple line is which one? The US-led invasion of Iraq, 205. In the heart of the war in Iraq, the homicide rate of those years, listen very carefully, the war affected deaths, 205 per 100,000. Now we're speaking, the, the lecture is about three countries. Let's get that. Jamaica, Belize and Trinidad, and I'm giving it to you in a specific order. Belize, sorry, Jamaica, Trinidad, Belize, Jamaica, Belize, Trinidad. Now, this is Jamaica, look very carefully. There are two parishes in Jamaica, Kingston and St. James, and those two parishes have the two what? Let me see if you know your region. The two cities, right? Kingston and Montego Bay. Last year, Montego Bay, not last year, the year before, 2017, Montego Bay was the most violent place on earth. What is the warning here? I'm saying to you, Belize can actually get worse. Actually, let me borrow a road off the street, it can't get worse. 
Okay? And part of what we're part of what we're trying to do is to make sure it gets better or better rather than worse or worse. If you take the line at the top, right, the red line, it says what the male combatant, right? Line. I want you to look very carefully for me. You realize that in those two cities, two parishes. In Kingston, on average, between 2010 and 2016, the homicide rate for that group, age group, in Kingston was 414. That's twice Iraq at full-scale war. Are you with me? And in St. James, 1.3 times Iraq. So just wanted you to recognize that it can get worse. So let's move to the third. I'm giving you 10 basics about violence reduction. Let's move to number three. Did you know the entire LAC has had one success story? Take your time. Imagine, imagine a region with 9% of the world's population accounting for almost 40% of the world's murders having one success story that I'm supposed to go to the States pretty soon to have a meeting about because people have begun in the last few years to say the country has too much social welfare. Nicaragua. Nicaragua went very socialist. They, 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 they pumped tons and tons of money into something that Caribbean people hate, educating boys. Did you just hear the expletive? I hope no police are around to arrest me. Educating boys, one of the biggest bad words in the region. Everybody hates those words. Educating boys. Because education in the region has become for girls. Yeah. So if you want to piss somebody off, just get up in the morning and say, I'm going to educate boys. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in a region in which it is really a social expletive to say we're educating boys? But that's what they did. They educated boys, they empowered girls. They actually had something called community-based policing. They pulled a massive power. Now you get life for that. No, no parole. Police, community-based policing, you mean police officers who come and say good morning, who are part of your group, who comes to your community meetings, who work with you, who understand your problem and pretend they have two, two bars multiplied by two? <laughs> Those are harsh words. You are not to say these things when you're on the street. In the quiet and the safety of the place, you can say community-based policing. When you get back outside, say suppression. Because that's what we do in the region. We suppress, we suppress, we suppress. And everybody here who cooks on a Sunday knows the power of a pressure cooker, am I right? Huh? That shirt minus the R will, will explode. So, all of this in Nicaragua was tied with something called violence interruption. And that's how they did it. The homicide rate for Nicaragua on average in the last five years 15 per 100,000. Isn't that crazy? Half, less than half of the problem in Belize. And by the way, it was coming from very high in the 60s. Now, suggestions made publicly to stop that calls for international attention because we can, you can't take the one story and make a mockery of it.
In El Salvador, we had the opposite. Am I right? We had something called, you remember that? Huh? Red, proper big fish. Not like mine. Mine's not so big. You know? Kind of too scrawny. But you have a group of red. Yeah. Like that man's fist. Yeah. Right? Right, my brother? Real big and puff, right? Good. And just sometimes you don't just even get mano dura, it gets super. You know? In Jamaica, we had a policeman says, We need to catch them, their little crocodiles. We need to catch them before they hatch. Don't get those words twisted. Doesn't that sound genocidal to you? It don't sound like genocide to you? Catching kids before they are hatched from their crocodile mothers? Did you miss it? But these were utterances of members of the state. Persons who represent the state. The face of the state. And these are some of the things that we've been doing. But these policies in El Salvador went horribly south. They were bad. And then, let's swing to New York. Remember New York in the early 80s, meaning just after 2000, you remember? Uh, two decades ago, we're in 2019, so it's actually, time's running. Some of us are getting gray, yeah? Two decades ago, in New York, they had really heavy fists for a short time, and then they stopped abruptly and said, you know what, let's get soft. Let's get a bit left. Let's become a little bit more socialist. Let's become more community-based. And guess what happened? The rate of decline of murders in New York began to double because kids were going to school. Black kids were taken off the streets and back to school. Because people are understanding that violence is actually similar to a health problem. Since independence in Jamaica, 1962, Jamaica has had almost 20 decent looking plans. Lord, beautiful crime fighting plans. But you know what is hilarious? There are two hilarious things about Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean. Any nonsense we do, you follow. You think I'm joking? Stay with me a little bit. In 2010, we shut down Jamaica, state of emergency, you remember that? Yeah. And Belize says, wait for me, we're coming. <laughs> and then Trinidad says, you can't leave me out of this man. What a bacana. By 2011, I was shut down in the airport in Trinidad, called by the government of Trinidad. Isn't that funny? You get a call, you go, but you can't go to the airport because guess what, man? We're doing what you do in Jamaica, man. Back and out. I think the time has come for us to emulate good things. You don't think so? Huh? If a country makes an error, you, you can't do the same. But here's where the bombshell is, because you actually think that it's the government that is making these errors. No, it's you. Did you know the people in El Salvador called for a super hand? Did you know that governments do what you ask, because if they don't, you'll vote them out. I bet you thought that this was all about the government. You have nothing. You walk away freely. You go to church, and you just pray to the Lord, and, you have, and your sins are cleansed. Eh? -eh. Ain't no cleansing right now. We demanded of our governments in the region suppression. Why? Because we have suffered a long time and we need, we need somebody to snap their finger like that and solve the problem now. A 
Am I right? Huh? And governments do one thing. They normally call a bunch of students, the cheapest ones they can find, ask them to keep their heads on the ground and tell them what it is that you're saying. Give them the fact that having been, having been put in power, they're no longer con connected to you directly anymore. Their houses get nicer. They put on a little bit more weight. Their skins are now moisturized. <laughs> and you actually think they represent you. The aim of government is to stay in power. And if you murmur every day, say me one day, lock them in the cowboy, you know, me one day, lock them in the lock them down, man, and throw the key. Somebody in government may be dumb enough to give you what you ask. A mother once said to me, Herbs, we come out to the police station and we tell them, say, can I go out for me, Terry? I have to break that one down for you. <laughs> it means reform school. Herbs, me go there and me go for me knee and me say, officer, me I beg you, me I beg you, officer, can go out for me, Terry. I they wicked enough, me can go. <laughs> Do you see our dilemma? The poor police officer should have been trained enough to know that you are only ranting. You know that new word? Ranting. We ranting, don't? But our rantings are becoming serious. We're hurting each other. Yeah? Be careful what you ask for. But it, it gives us a cycle. I'm going to look at the cycle. A, we have a spike in murders, right? Right? And B, we have an operation, don't. Let me give you some of the names in the Caribbean for operations. Operation Jaguar. And the young man says, John wash go like rain. Say, so that rain of hard to go on road. <laughs> Operation John Mama is a big puss. <laughs> Operation Kingfish. Yes, Kingfish. And the youth them say, me a shark. <laughs> Kingfish have a fail out. Shark. Do you understand what's going on? And these kids make a mockery of us because they know it doesn't work. So we have B, we have a suppression response. And guess what happens? C, it forces the murder down, especially for the election is coming. There's something nice about suppression and election. It's almost like they're cousins. You know, make a call and say, hey, yo, hey, yo, election is coming. All right, all right, there's suppression, we're there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to force the murders down. Yeah, man, yeah, man, yeah, man. I'm going to force the murders down. Right after the election, they'll come back up, but the idiot they won't realize. So we work the system out. And then, D, we have no redeployment of the gang members, don't? We just say, go down. And then stay down. Nice election, nice events happen, and everything go. And then, boom, right back. Let's look at some of the figures. This is Jamaica since its independence. A laughing stock situation. The top figure is clear up rate, and the bottom figure is murders. And each time these figures touch, at the point of 30 per 100,000, we're having a you're learning. We're having a civil war. Now watch the drama. So in 1980, we had a big tribal war. The green people them called labor right, and the orange people them called comrades had a major war in which 800 young men killed themselves. Yeah? 800 dead bodies. Okay? And you thought that was bad. And then they cross again where? 1996, you can see that. And then by 2005, they don't like crossing again. 
One's gone that direction, and the other one's gone that direction. They count them a bubble to cross because it's no longer in the civil war benchmark threshold. It's just war. Now let me tell you this, the little thing that you don't know. Every time you see these things that these these flare-ups, there's one of the 19 beautiful operational crime plan. Come research day, gone. We just had one in which the Minister of National Security and myself and the opposition and everybody sat on one platform and we talk about the new five-year plan. And everybody said, look like the last plan. <laughs> but come on, after a certain while, they run out of new lyrics, you know? Come on, be honest, man. If you know a girl that you like, huh? give you two years of chasing her. It's difficult to become creative, don't. When you tell her something, she said, you told me that the last time. You run out of lyrics. So crime plans in the region look like the same old crime plan you grew up with, am I right? They run out of lyrics. Number four. Even as people demand suppression, most of them know the limits of the police. Did you know that? There's a word for it, you know, it's called dualism. You want a Jamaican version of it? We are ginals. Know that word? Ginals. Dualism. A lot of Caribbean people are Rastafari and Catholic at the same time, you know. Don't laugh, it's true. We are duals. We're very dualized. Anyhow, the Catholics in my in my country, anyhow, they are having back to school tree. Hey, everybody, I hear Mary. Big up yourself, Mary. Yes, Mary, big up yourself. Hail Mary. Give me back to school money, man. I want to get up to the world. Ja! Rastafari, I believe in the machine of faithful. We're dual people. We know how to ball and carry on when we want things done. And then right afterwards, we smile and say, but it bad enough. <laughs> so we know that suppression doesn't work, even though we are demanding it. Am I right? So let's look at some of the data. Let me show you a few charts. You're going to find this is a recent study, recent major study with over 1,000 young people in Montego Bay, which is the hotbed. Montego Bay and Spanish Town in Jamaica. And look very carefully. Groups that bring relief to community wars, where do you see the police? Right up top, don't. Huh? It's the number one. So everybody recognize that the police can help you bring what? Immediate relief in your community, right? But look at when the long-term work starts. Look if you can find the police. Groups you depend on for jobs and money, the VIP program that we're going to start, we're going to speak about at the end. It means Violence Interruption Program, which is a program that was started in Chicago. All right? Then you see the politicians giving up the money, right? Same money that we give them to give the youth, right? It's a beautiful game, you know. We give the politicians money, they give the youth and say, Worship me! And it works. Then you have the CSJP, which is about citizen security. Then the church and the dons. The dons are the leaders of camps. And then the elders, and it goes all the way. And look where the NGO them there. <laughs> Yo, me now laugh. Look at where the lazy NGOs are. Now, believe me. I have an issue with a lot of NGOs because a lot of NGOs have something called overheads. Mm. May God help you all if you are NGO with a heavy overhead and less than 20% to help the little people that are running up. The young people thought the NGOs could do much better. And, that's, I'm, and I'm being very kind. Groups that counsel and mediate, the church, the VIP, the CSJP, you won't see anything that says the state. 
groups that provide training, HART, which is a big second chance program in, in the region, and you'll see schools and, and so forth, and the politicians have back to school programs. So the young people are aware that the police can only help you have an immediate ceasefire. But afterwards, because they don't understand community-based policing, they can't help you any further. Are we clear on that? So let's move to number five. A force reduction represents a spike within 24 months and upward climb. This is where we have the real problem. But I want to go back. Let's go back a little bit. I want you to have a laugh. Look at this. If you are doing something from 1960, and in 2005, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Now time your tap. Huh? How you are going to fool? Realize I use a Jamaican example because I don't want you to laugh at yourself yet. <laughs> but, be, but be honest with yourselves. If you are doing something from 1962 until now and the results are just simply getting worse. Boy, but humans, we, we tick them. You know the word tick? With thick man. This reminds me of a man who says to me, boy, you know, I've been having sex with my baby mother. And, you know, anytime I, I reach that point, I just pull out. And, and the wicked woman still breathe. <laughs> and I say, how, how many children do you have? Nine. <laughs> nine. My God, you reach nine. And I can't. Pick up a book and read. <laughs> nine? Do you know how long it takes to call from one to nine? <laughs> but we think, man, 1960. The only difference between Jamaican Belize here is that you started in 1981. <laughs> so you start, your, your idiot life started right there. So. <laughs> So laugh all you want. We're just a little bit older in this stupidness. <laughs> Doing the same thing. How can you do the same thing repeatedly and get worse and worse results but continue? How? I'll tell you how. You ask for it. They give it to you. There's an election. They do it all over again. And in the midst of it, a few people get rich. It works. And the rest of you cuss and quarrel. But in Caribbean style, after two nice expletives, two nice bad words, you're hard cool. <laughs> and you go home. Huh? In Jamaica and other streets of the Caribbean, after somebody tells you to go suck something, they're good. <laughs> There's a car accident. Cuss. Cost a thousand Belizean dollars. I saw this with my own eyes right here in Belize. You're not very different from us. Two cars hit. A car drove out in the road, hit another car. The man said, Suck something, boy, boy. And drive off. No need for the thousand Belizean dollars to fix the car because you're telling to suck. <laughs> you feel good. You don't even stop long enough to make sure you suck. We're crazy. Can't do that. So whenever you see murders like that, within 12 to 24 months, you are going to have a re-spike. And this time, on average, when we take the raw figures and look, you are going to have a 5% increase over every four-year blocks. And that has been the trend since our independence for Jamaica, for Belize, and for Trinidad. One big set of jokers. Look at, look at the figures. Let's start out with the green one, Jamaica. 
happens to be part of our flag, so it's interesting. <laughs> and bellies, you don't get escape because red is part of your flag. That's not my doing, that's what's excel, but let's look. <laughs> so Jamaica started, look at the starting point for all of these countries, you can see that? Pretty decently low, don't no? Huh? Except in ours, it's a high low. <laughs> but each time you have Operation Jaguar, Operation whatever, Operation whatever, Operation Acid in Jamaica, Operation Kingfish or whatever, it, it, it keeps, you see that? But the end result is that the trajectory is higher. You can see that. So when you look at where you started and where you're at, it's higher. Number six. Heavy policing is not only expensive on taxpayers, burning up two-thirds of national security. Can you imagine? 67% is a lot, you know? For something on average to take 67%. For all different kinds of groups abroad to write about how the region spent tons and tons of money on suppression and make a mock of you. You pick up, you pick up international papers and you read about the Caribbean and how much money we spend on policing and how much whatever and not on schools and so forth. And the message now becomes rancid, don't? But there's a heavy cost in human life. Did you know in Jamaica the police account for between 12 and 20 percent of all violent deaths? Did you know we calculated that they can actually all kill the two biggest gangs in Jamaica combined? You are slightly better in this instance. But it can get to that. The police suffer from something called fear factor. They get so scared after a while that they shoot first. One shot is cousin. And listen carefully, his favorite cousin. Can you imagine shooting your favorite cousin? Huh? When we have interesting things in Jamaica, we call Zoso and those things. You don't need no Zoso. You have a history of the exact same thing. The police come, police just come up, all the more them off the road. We have a practice in the region where we arrest the young men on Friday and let them on Monday morning. When they come on Monday morning, they're stiff. <laughs> Miss school. Huh? Creep up, not scrape up, creep up. Creep them up off the road. Fascinating. In some countries such as Jamaica, Trinidad, Belize, people get killed by the state. Yeah? And that's crazy. There's nothing funnier than watching Caribbean people talking about Black Lives Matter. You ever hear those jokes? You sit here, fastening in the American people business, but this is true, black lives matter. You're worse. Because the victims in the Caribbean have a face, they all look the same. They're usually showing body signs of not being properly fed, Tick. Hold on, you think I'm joking? Every time a body falls in the Caribbean, they fit five categories. And in fact, they fit five categories because we give them the five star treatment. Big old, dirty, thinking, drunk. You want me to tell you what those five words mean in Jamaica? If somebody ever see you walking on the road and call you a big old dirty thinking drunk girl, that combination not funny. Big meaning that you look 
strong and you're a threat, yeah? All meaning you pass 12, you can't dead now. So big old dirty, dirty because you are really poor. You can't afford all kinds of nice things. Most inner city you have work with have one wicked looking shoes. And you wonder why when a man step on a man's shoes, a man get brain girl. Yo, I two months we see about my baby, sit up. Hey boy, I step on my clocks. And you who can buy five clocks don't understand why. <laughs> you know how many times I go to young people's dark sit down, that's the term you use. For them little, them little place, they got a pallet and stuff like that. I just say one nice pants, hang up night corner, one nice shoes. And everything else that child has look like ten dollars attack it. And every day the quarter road. Right? In fact, I was told you mustn't make your left foot pass your right foot. <laughs> because the man come out, step out in I'm one piece of clothes. Because at the end of the day, one of the first things your mother teach you when you're poor, never make them see how poor you are being. Have some pride. So you don't know how poor they really are until you go look inside them dark sit down. The way you so far. And we live this duality trying to make sense of life. But here's the get adapt in 18 different ways. Don't even have the time to take you through the 18 because your common sense can pick them up anyway. We're going to talk about Anyhow, you have a curfew in the city. The gangs move to the peri-urban. And as you move to the peri-urban, they move to the rural areas. And very soon, you no longer have a belly city problem. You have a belly problem. Am I right or am I right? Now it used to cost you $10 to the police here. It now it's costing you $50. Really? Jamaica has two. Guess how many bellies have? Two and children have two. Yeah, but your mother ever tell you not to walk in bad company? These three countries, man, they're like three little bad picnic. <laughs> Anything one do, the other one have it. You don't know yet, you have two. You have another gang hub, you know. This is not the only one. This is the big one that you're concerned about when you head up to car inside. You have another gang hub. In Jamaica, we have Kingston and Montego Bay. Trinidad, same thing. All the way up there and then down in Chaguenas. Same thing. So now look at what happens. Gangs are supposed to spread economically because gangs are into economics, right? But the state is not supposed to help them spread. Not true. Average since the year 2000 will be 150. Six. You can see that? Okay. And then Kingston moved into St. Catherine. So Crips. So you have Crips and Blood here, MS-13 and so forth. In Jamaica, we have Clansman and one other. But this is one other. And those two. <laughs> and they spread into St. Catherine. That's an affluent parish of Manchester. The parish where it costs the most to date a girl. <laughs> because the girl will ask, do you have property, sir? <laughs> <laughs> no property? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> but no guns. Did you know that guns actually went to Manchester and gave out leaflets to business people? Pay your extortion or we shoot you and your family. They actually drove in the middle of the day in Manchester, giving out leaflets to people to say, we are here. Hello, we are here. We are going to extort you. And it will be systematic. And part of the letter that they were giving around says, don't think because you have a license for a that makes any difference. 
You should Google it. It's actually, it's actually in the news. Quite funny. This happened two years ago. So let's go to the other one, Montego Bay. Montego Bay is the one that says 101, St. James. Can you see that from down there? He says jam. That's St. James. Then St. James, of course, affected Westmoreland and Hanover. And then now they're taking on a new little one, Trelawney. And now they're going into St. Elizabeth, the breadbasket of Jamaica. That parish alone exports more than 25% of the country's food export. Imagine farmers <laughs> under the threat of gas. Fascinating. And that happens when you have curfews in that area. For all this, we've been trying to say to people, if you're gonna have a strategy, understand the entire hubs, don't. So when you move in one area, you go to the catchment areas because that's where they go. No, everybody wants the curfew, one small area. And we don't care where the fish swim to. We have it covered. Nice soup. <laughs> Number eight. <coughs> Number eight. <coughs> violence models. All violence models. All violence models are complicated. Did you know that? You will never find a violence model, a violence reduction model, or a violence model that is linear. A plus B plus C equals D plus a margin of error. That's what you learn in first year, right? Those things don't happen in real life. Those things happen because you're in first year, you're not so smart. <laughs> it's not that the first thing they taught you in class, right? A simple model. Those things don't exist in real life. Let's look at the model for the region. All right? And this region, by that we, again, we're talking about the three, the three countries. So let's take five minutes on this, because I want you to get this. This is the essence of how we are in the trouble we're in. How comes our shirt dropped out the R? and know we're in a mess. <laughs> we have a history of violence, right? Many countries in the region has really never ever seen a day free of violence. Did you know that? Did you know that? We have a, a massive history of violence. Because of a massive history of violence, we have a set of problems. If you come out of slavery, you are going to end up, if you are colonized, you are going to end up without fathers. Take your time. Take your time. We're going on the right first, then we're going to go on the left, then we're going to come in the center. Let me give you the figures. In 1948, at the time of Jamaica's early election, the colonial office and other groups did a check on what percentage of children had a father in the home. Here's the percentage, 18%. Oh God, somebody in the back says, oh God. You feel it with the sister? Sounds like a female voice. Oh God. We need to all say the oh God because it's true. How you have a country with 80% of pygmy have a pupa in the yard. But that's where we're coming from. That's where we're coming from. And I'm going to share a dumb moment that we, we have. In fact, I think there have been uh, 17 dumb books written on this dumb topic. In, in, so in 1948, we had 80% of children having who, what? A biological father in their home, right? Clear? By 1971, it was up from 18 to 27%. 
There's a difference. In 1999, <clears throat> just before I went to school in England, the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation called me in a very desperate voice. When people call you with a high-pitched voice, you need to go. <laughs> it's very important. So I went. And this woman, Mrs. McNeil, I'll never forget her. She said, Doc, you know, every time we patch up these girls, we patch them up, we patch them up, they go home and then breathe again. <clears throat> of course, later there was a song by Tony Braxton that says, breathe again, breathe again. Eh? <laughs> but but you, know, you know we Caribbean people have to mispronounce it and misact it out, right? So if the girls breathe again. But what's fascinating about all of this is that we sat with her, with the head of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, and we came up with brainstormed and we came up with a, a beautiful solution, one of inclusion. Can we take a risk and just say that word? Is anybody going to arrest us if we say it? Inclusion? Inclusion. Can we say it together? Inclusion. Inclusion. It's kind of scary, but try it. What? Inclusion. We actually got the baby fathers. Send them back to school too. And the girl stopped singing Tony Braxton's song. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? From 70% repeat pregnancy to 17% in three years. Can we get an amen in the church? Just because for the first time we had inclusion, we Caribbean people came up with our own idea of how to go forward. It never came from the North. Because the North would have had another agenda. Ah. Ah. Did I stutter? Ah. Because people who bring money to you have an idea of how things work. They don't know how things work here but they have an idea, and because they have the money and you licky licky, <laughs> you take the idea and make it reality in an era where there's a different reality. Am I right so far? Yeah. Huh? So anytime you see a lot of absent fathers, is it an indicator or is it a cause? Let me give you something. 17 books written by 17 lazy people. Write this garbage. Absent Fathers is one of the platforms of gang violence in the region. Raise your hands, those of you who've heard that nonsense. Come on, it's your moment of confession. Come on. Absent Fathers, now stay with me. In 1962, the homicide rate for Jamaica was four per hundred thousand. What was it? Four per 
100,000 because part of our violence is about the transition from being a colony to being independent, really independent, not independence on paper. So if the homicide rate was four per 100,000, when you only had 21%, and today it high, high, high like a BG kite, it means that you are having more fathers, and at the same time you're having what? More murders. So actually, if you were lazy and not so lazy, you would have said the opposite. The more fathers we have in the home, the more murders we have. Uh -huh. You see how lazy can people can be? Can I tell you how they end up with such a stupid conclusion? They went down to a prison, interviewed the young men in a prison, realized that most young men in a prison have no pupa, and said, you know what? Guess what? The last time they were upset in ice cream, people drowned. <laughs> What's the intervening variable? It's called summer. <laughs> when summer comes, people will drown. Ice cream sales will go up, you idiot. <laughs> so people think, guess what? The boy that have no father and he kill people, and the father do it. Here's the bombshell. The boy not have no father, but the boy grew up with a very angry mother. A mother, in one case, who was raped seven times, who swear, Herms, me are telling the truth. Me rather, me killing me son. Do you understand that? We're gonna come back to some of these. So whenever there is a situation, let me clarify this. Anywhere you go, there's a place in Belize we call the South Side. The average for Belize is what? 64%, yes. Catholicism, wherever it exists, there'll be a lot of marriages anywhere in the world. Once we see you have high copper data, we know you're Catholic. <laughs> Let's just get it. Mexico, 68%. Belize, 64%. Yeah, Spanish speaking are in that region, high copper rates. <laughs> Highest in the world, higher than a first world, without the money and the social structure. <laughs> Lots of weddings. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> not making a mockery of it, I'm just saying. You can't use those data in a Latin area to make sense of things because in these areas, people like to tie knots. That's, that's all I'm saying. But I want you to understand that when you move from the average of Belize to the south side, it drops from 64% Meaning only 30% of the boys in the South Side have a father, or in fact only 40% of a father figure. So it dropped by more than 50%, am I right? Huh? You don't do nothing well, talk to me. <laughs> if you drop from 64 to 30, now what if I drop that? It's over 50%, because 50% would have been 32, don't? Yes. Pray the Lord your math brain came back. <laughs> so, it means, therefore, in a violent area, in a violent area, we have something called urban polyandry. Women can't dare have one man who is earning $10. When it takes to raise a child. Take your time. Take your time and get this. 
We train our women to learn that the way forward is to get money from men. Am I right? And the country has no welfare state. Huh? So, you have one child. You've worked out in your head it takes 50 shillings to raise this child per day, don't? But you happen to have the child with a man who earns 20 shillings. How much shilling is missing? 30 shillings. Your math is back. Great. You set up a clap. Your math is back. So 50 shillings to raise the child per day. One man, 20 shillings. Come on, we're working on principles of logic. In the background, you've learned man have money. Come on, little girl, what did I say to you? Your first lesson of the day. Come on, say it. Man have money. So how many men do you need to get 50 shillings? Two and a half. Two and a half. And there's always a half man. Two and a half. Now, here's the bombshell in the region. The Caribbean has more jackets than everywhere else. Polyandry meaning the opposite of polygy. Meaning that women have a lot of men. But these men serve a function. Is that idol? She has no idol to be. <laughs> she wants the money. That's a song, by the way. Shaba. <laughs> Big old dirty shaba. Yeah. Yeah. And we said, we know a woman with two children and five baby fathers. Can anybody better that? And a woman called and said, her, that woman did not understand what the word again? Urban polyology like me. We have three BNB and seven BNB fathers. <laughs> Welcome to the inner city. If the state won't produce if the state won't have a welfare, if the state doesn't provide education for people at the bottom quintile, they will find the most creative ways to sustain life. But those of us who live with the argument that herbs have children the poorest mothers, that's not the essence. The point I'm making is that we have to intervene to ensure the poorest mothers have food because having three men does a damage to the child called monotrophy. A child grow up having a bond with his mother. A lot of fathers get this thing wrong. They think because they're in love with a woman and the woman says, I'm in love with you, baby. That means that the strongest bond on earth, the strongest bond on earth is between a mother and her son. Uh, try to get that. Every single man here who's tried to date a woman who has a son know this story well. Come out and I'll tie a puncture. <laughs> Pure sabotage. I want to hold potato and push up your, 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 your mouth. You don't know the thing, man. I'm going to don't know the thing. <laughs> You've tried to date a woman who has a son. And by the way, if, if the boy is between three and five years old, it's worse. Because I'm not kicking her shin. And you can buy cheese chicks and ice meat and all kind of, and sweet it in a week. <laughs> trying to grab this boy, and as soon as the sweet thing burn out, you're under pressure again. <laughs> and by the time they get to 12, they tell you, mother, how long your skirt should be. They start to practice on you. Mom, why? Mom, you can't go on the road like that. Mama can't see your breasts. Mom, change that front. It looked too pretty. <coughs> they want you to walk around and look boring. You know that, right? <laughs> because they're the boss. And by age 12, a boy will step out in front of a truck to save your life. 
Nobody else on earth you can guarantee will die for you except your son. That's how the species created. That's how we are. So when a father is absent, the bond between a mother and a son becomes deepened. Let me draw something from Haiti. I ugly, but my mother like me. <laughs> Don't take that lightly. It means that if everybody else on earth abuse you, your mother dare not abuse you. We're going to go through some of this because you need to understand it. This is a major issue for us in this country. Boy, time to a tree, go to the ant's nest, make a trail of chicken back fat all the way from the tree, from the ant's nest to the tree, and tell me herbs, them ants are some wicked ants. You know how long we put the chicken back fat and the ants are lazy. They're not going to go back to one. Eventually, they beat the boy until he passed out. And you jump up and you get very emotional about it. But that's the best the mother could do. Try and understand that. I know a mother who beat up some things I won't teach you. And give the boy some, every time you see him walking slow, temporary disability. I'm serious. And she said, Herbs. You see the Don? The Don meaning the head of the gang. It recruit every point the boy inside of this community, but he can't recruit mine because Herbs, he can't walk past an ankle. <laughs> How did we get to a place where mothers must do everything that's in their limited minds? Because these are uneducated women, I even so far, to try and see if they can save the boy picnic. Of course, we know the result is that tortures are dangerous, don't. But these mothers are trying. One of the things I'm trying to do back home is to educate these mothers, give them new alternatives. But you cannot educate hungry people. You have to also find food. You have to also find something called ontological security. You have to. Make sure that people have a sense of tomorrow. Otherwise, you can't help them. So that's the right side. Let's go to the left. The left side is quickly because you can go to the left side very easily. Segmentary factional politics. JLP versus PLP. In the you have UDP versus DP. No. Me? Blue or red? Hey, don't talk to me, you're blue. Don't talk to me, you're red. Hey, hey. Thank God you're not as bad as we are. Free green and orange in Jamaica tunnel. <laughs> well, you're not far off. So we're very segmentary. If something is blue, it stay blue. And it just draw everything around it blue. That's all. And somebody in red have the answer, but in red, not just say that. And the other way around, not say that. And therefore, we end up having what? Weak central political authority. We covered these things in, in, in our report last time. And then, here, all hell broke loose because the judiciary have its own clan and class. The parliament has its own plans. The police they're frustrated and they come from the same poor people like the victims, not joke. They're not victims too. Pass them a bus stop after them just beat up a youth, then go a bus stop and I bet the same youth arrive for home. <laughs> and the youth said, drunk, or you remember me? And the police run gone down the road. Herbert Gale saw that with his own two big red eyes, same place in Belize. I saw that. I saw the police running, and I asked why I'm running. <laughs> and somebody said, sir, you know, I never believe it, you know. They said, I'm bothering you, listen to me. He beat up the youth this morning, you know. I know it's up and works, and I look boss to go home, and he see one character later come. And when he flagged on the car, I see a youth that just beat up this man, and it hurt. <laughs> it's a sad joke. 
Because it means the police themselves are looking for answers, don't we? Mm -hmm. Huh? Now we can't just castigate them and beat them up because they come from the exact same socioeconomic status, same situation as the people who are being relegated to not in this region. So in all of this, in all of this mess, the right side, your right side, is producing, is creating what is called a gang pool from which we create all these gangs. First characteristic of a gang member is an absent father and a mother he has a bad relationship with. You think I'm joking? Call any NGO that works with gangs. Ask them for you to talk to 10 and see how many of them have a good relationship with their mother. The gang becomes their home because they don't have a home to go to. So whilst you would look at normal kids, one out of 10 may have a problem with their mother in gangs, five or six or seven have a major problem, crisis with their mother and the papa gang. You can see what's going on? So when I have a child who has an absent father and a mother who used to torture him, and the dad says, I am your Jesus. He has no other Jesus that he knows. But the gang. I interviewed a boy who shot his first cousin here in Belize, and he said to me, the dad said, if you do it. And I said, what do you mean by that? I said, cousin, why did you not feed me? Yeah. You get it? Let's go on. Can we, can we set that bigger? All right, let's go on. Number nine, most repeat killers were tortured by caregivers. I think, I think we've made this point clear. If you look at, and I want you to look for those persons who'd like to hear the sample, this to these samples. In Jamaica, we have 2,216 young men. Does that sound like a lot to you? It is a lot. In Trinidad, 795, and in Belize, 509 young men. Using a program, a, a, a system, research system we call PEER. Look at the findings. In Jamaica, 6% of young men between the age of 15 and 34 in the inner cities we discounted had killed somebody. Not 100%, 6%, which means out of the other 94%, you can find something to work with. Am I right? Plus, you can also work with the 6%, but you may want to get some help with the 6%, yeah? In the south side, right as we're doing, we're comparing the south side with Jamaica. It's 5.5%. And in Port of Spain, 5%. So we know for sure the bulk of inner city kids are actually, have actually not killed anybody. They're just desperate and hungry. <coughs> in Port of Spain, 31% of all inner city males reported being tortured growing up as boys. In Belize, it's 35%. In Jamaica, 46%. You know, we always better at anything that's not so good. <laughs> the more violent the ecology, the more boys were tortured. And that's because mothers and other caregivers are doing their best in ignorance to help these children. And by the way, between 78 and 80% 80 of these mothers were tortured themselves or raped growing up. Therefore, it's a language they understand. They understand that so one proper box down can solve the entire world crisis. So let's look at those tortured by their mothers. In Trinidad, 26%, Belize, 29%, Jamaica, 36%. We're more violent, so you're going to see higher figures for us. Of critical importance here is that about two thirds of those who killed someone reported being tortured by their mothers. And all who had killed, more than three, those we call professional killers, all of those were tortured. So let's, let's see if we summarize that. In the inner cities overall, this is for Jamaica's figures, which is the biggest data set, 40, 44% of these kids would have been tortured. 
For those who never killed, you'd have had 45.4%. If you kill once, 56, 59% of this group would have, would have been tortured. Kill twice, 75%. And every single young man would kill three or more persons, plus rape or kill a woman, was tortured by a mother. You getting that? Because then you transfer it to another woman, don't? Number 10. 10 a nice number, because it's the end, isn't it? Any violence reduction plan must address violence at three levels, with emphasis on the primaries. This is where the bad word cussing starts. With emphasis where? On the what? Primaries. So let's look at the primary. Let's look. Let's start with the primary. The primary is what? Preventative. It is the foundational. It is structural. And it is long lasting. It is what? Long lasting. And there's a word for it. It's called, that is where we get the two words. Sustainability. Remember that big word we learned in class? Sustainability. We're going to learn development. And then there's another one. Ontological security. Now, let's look at the characteristics. At the individual level, we're talking about what? Getting your boy Pitney then into school. The focus cannot be on the quality of education alone. It must be also on the full participation huh, of education. Every single child deserves to be in school until at least age 18. This is where I'm going to tell you some data we found in the case of in Montego Bay, sorry. We had boys who were doing CAPE. You know that word, CAPE? A-levels, sixth form, whichever one you're accustomed to. And we compared them to the shutters. Shutters here meaning youth who are in a gang who've killed, right? So we had a mixture of just gang members, but a lot of them were shutters. So we had the two extremes. On our left, we had kids whose parents had enough resources, whose mothers were creative enough in some instances, who had extended families with so far. Huh? You know, with extended family, grandma, uncle, everybody pitching in to help this one boy. I have a family project, that's why I'm here. My older brothers and sisters would eat less so that I can get some food to eat. And they would pinch a part of their lunch money to give me. They would always check on me, Herbie, you're the bright one, you're going to go somewhere. Yeah, I'll give part of my lunch, just remember me when you have money. <laughs> I don't know like a meal. You don't have those experiences. Huh? Some of you are family projects too. So why am I looking at this train? <laughs> but it means that those boys, those boys really ended up doing their cake. Yes? And on the other side, boys who are gang members. You'll never believe. The difference between being shot, the boys who are doing cake were so safe that they were 11 times less likely to be shot than the ones who were in the gang. They were 10 times less likely to shoot somebody than the ones who are in gangs. And I say to every single listening Caribbean policymaker, choose one. Okay? Gunshot. What does this kid, what does this group represent? It means that if these kids make it to grade 13 or grade 12, yeah? It means that everybody is investing, don't. It means that they are 
they've experienced something called smartification. They are smarty. They've been smartified. While the other group is drunkified. So you have to choose between smartificating the young people to drunkenizing them, don't. You have to choose between one. Drunk, by the way, is a raven for those who are just visiting the, the region. So we have a situation here. Mentorship. You can see those parenting skills. You can see those basic things that Nicaragua did. You can see that? And at the community level, economic opportunities. Community having community tourism and all these fancy stuff. Huh? Changing violence norms, setting up big brothership in your communities and, and community people themselves doing the work and not waiting for Jesus to send a miracle in the name. <laughs> Let's move to the second dream. This is the visible, this is the one that politicians like. When you're done, you can leave a plaque, don't? I was there, <laughs> vote for me. But they're visible. This is what we call the redeployment. Because if you're combatants and you are asking someone to exchange a hammer for a gun, right? Or a gun for a hammer, there has to be redeployment. And I want to take a little time to remember John Wood. Remember that man? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Anybody know that name? Yeah. Yeah. He was one, one evening and he said to me, Herbs. I have this captive audience. The term was interesting. I have this captive audience, Herbs. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> we need to do something positive with them. What do you think? I said, yes, yes. And he said, you know, we need to come up with an idea to work with them so that they can do something. And we brainstorm by email. You know, he would pass it to his son, his gun, back to him, and back to Herbs, and, and we had this little brainstorm, and then he came up, BAM! We have a contract to build a highway, I'm gonna make these kids do it! And terrible people said, I said, it affected the murder rate in Belize. Because for once, we had organized redeployment. You know how projects go, don't no? It dies. Car the road down. But it's a lesson. At least we can get a lesson from it. And then we get to tertiary. And that's the one we call morphinization, don't? No? So you have a disease called violence, right? You go into the hospital to cut it out, am I, am I right? But you're in a lot of pain. But you, so you need immediate attention, you need relief. And they give you morphine, don't? And here's the problem, guess what you do now with the morphine now? But come surgery time, doc, can I get a second shot? Please note the look at my face because that's the impact of morphine. And you're happy delaying the surgery, don't? Because it's just all smiles. In fact, somebody told me, herbs, the most horny I've ever been in my life is when I got a morphine shot. I was so ready. It's nice. Quietly, we are becoming junkies of suppression, am I right? We have a problem, police come out, there's a new operation, and things go down. And we're hoping they have another operation before we go back up, don't. Junkies of suppression. People love peace treaties, don't. Ceasefire, uh, states of emergency, relocation of the problem, and my problem anymore. No, you get you call over the <laughs> deal. Yes, I am. And then halfway through, you say, but hold on, don't aunt Jim live over the deal. Am I right? Because you're a small population, which means you're all cousins. Yeah. And the and the and the church marches. You have them here. Come on, brethren and sisters, let's just go into the road and we're going to wave the Bible and we're going to pray. Hallelujah. 
We're going to pray. God already given the answer. We are praying. So. Talk to me, man. Come on. God made a group of us come here and we, and we had a whole big team and we do the study and we hand it to you and you are praying. No, so I don't take God feed that. <laughs> we are praying to him. So one answer you don't get. Read the report. <laughs> We are about the fight. You know something that think God can. <laughs> church people marching upon the whole I go to church. Don't mix me up. But sometimes I'm tired of the church. You're on the road praying and doing all kinds of stuff. Go help to the hungry people then. That is why after all the road marching, the Lord said, I was in prison and you visited me not. Hungry and naked, I may never see you. So you come now. Why? Because I get red button shoes you want anybody to see of it. So we have to do some work and gun and gun amnesty. That one funny bad. Because all we do is bring in the old chip of chip of gun and get money to buy a new gun. Please. We have to embark on sensible projects. So here are some things to do. We have extrapolated that five percent of Jamaican families. And 3% of Trinidadian families, I honestly don't know the figures for Belize. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm going to assume it might be about 3% of families in Belize have a mother and a son or sons who are on the risk point of being in gangs and so forth. And these young people have mothers who don't go to church, they don't have a church support system. In Belize, we found three churches that really did serious welfare. That's a start. The other church people get up and wake up and do something. Pray, but go work, because prayer without works in Belize is gunshot. So let me list the things that you look for with these mothers. They have a son. The son is at risk of becoming a gang member. There's no visiting father. There's no extended family because sometimes they happen to move from a country park, come here and have nobody. You understand? Those people will create murderers. You can't have a family. Trust me on this. Don't go European on me right now. Stay African for a bit. It takes a village to raise a what? A child. Nuclear families and couple families, all the fancy open names we have for families. Don't work in violence. In this region, we, we know couple families, nuclear families in this region that produce gunmen. So I'm saying to you, if you get up to, on this weekend, and you look around in your church and you see, and I'll tell you where she sits, right at the back. You can know her. And she, if she threw not go, she threw it different. And I'm not making a mockery of anybody. Everybody here knows a suffering mother. Everybody here. I want to give you two that you remember. But you know, you can look around in your church and know that this woman is genuinely suffering. My first appeal to all of us is that the church should adopt that family. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Five or three percent. Whatever your percentage is, it's not going to be anywhere far from between five and three. Find these families. If anybody can sponsor the research to look for these families and begin to help them. I'm going to tell you the secret. In Jamaica, tortured boys who become repeat killers are called for 53% of our murders. Yes, it's more than one. And by the way, by going back to the raw data, 
I'm checking through some material that was given to me by a particular person. Big up yourself, won't call her name. We know 49% of the murders, someplace there, here are committed by people who kill more than once. And we know they are tortured. So if we can rescue these families early, in the next 15 years, we can begin to see, remember that long term, we can begin to see a climb. What are we searching for? We're searching for violence reduction without the return down. We want it to go down and stay down. We don't want it to bump and boom around and go back and dance and do and do dip and fall back. That's called suppression. So that's the first thing I want, my first appeal to us, is to focus on these mothers and to help them. Second thing I want to look at is this issue of corporal punishment in the region. My God, we love we have people. One teacher come to me and say, Herbs, what do you ever do if I can't have a kid? Hmm? And after joking and saying, no, teacher, you, you're talking not long enough to lick him. Don't lick him. <laughs> you know you have to use a little joke to, to break the eyes of people. I say, I, I understand. We say it's what is one is actually eating. I say, but there are alternatives. And I gave her a little handout about alternatives. And she was shocked. You mean these things work? Yes, they work. But if you don't teach teachers, and if you don't teach parents, that you can actually deny a child his Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. deny his Playboy or whatever he has, all these little gadgets, <laughs> huh? PlayStation. If we don't deny them these things and pick up the habits, now we have to begin to have little sessions. Put some money in parenting. Have a little town hall meeting and say three alternatives to beating the color out of the skin. These things work. Parents genuinely don't know what to do, and so do teachers who are also parents. So let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can end the torture within here. And the psychological torture is just as bad. Calling people, telling people, saying, bigger or ugly, and say, a bullfrog like him, pop. Hmm? <laughs> or telling the girl, telling the girl, eh? You, you are a whore like your mother. No, this, you know, we do these things, right? C, feuds decline when young men are busy. We beg of governments to invest in redeployment. Okay? D, let me introduce to you a program that has been doing well. Came out of Chicago called Cure Violence, the VIP, Violence Interruption Program, that has all three levels. I hope the government of Belize, I hope NGOs in Belize, I hope everybody in Belize will one day invite a group of people and start a unit here, in which you can have one member of a community work with the young men, become a big brother to them, take them out of gangs, redeploy them, and I hope, I hope, I hope, and this time I pray, that the same boy who told me, he's dead and gone now. He said, Herbs, when I was hungry and I walked past the woman the shop, and I begged her, she said, Where are you going? And the day I became a gang member, she called me to employ me as security. Let me hope that we will begin to help these young people before they become gang members. Because that is when we are going to employ them because we fail. Let me close by asking all of us, we're one family. I know you pick up by now that this is, this is an emotional moment for me. I would love to come to Belize and just enjoy the longest fully living barrier reef in the world. Do you know I 
don't know much of Belize. I don't know enough. I've come here many times. It's always to South Side. You understand for me? Okay. I've been to the Keys once or twice. I've been to one of the ruins. My team always tries. They try their best. Don't blame them. They try their best to see if they can grab a moment of me to take me to see this absolutely fabulous country. Even the time we went to PG, it was to work. Can you imagine going all the way to PG and it is to work? I would like to come here one day. In short, though, like a tourist. Why? Because the Belizean government, because the Belizean people have begun the process of balance reduction. This is how this thing works. It works from primary. When you are falling apart, the first thing that falls apart is your education system and your training system. Then your employment system, which is secondary, right, falls apart because you're not training people, so your people are not employable, mm -hmm. and then it erupts into violence. <laughs> when you're solving violence, you have a ceasefire. Right after you have the ceasefire, you redeploy. Right as you're redeploying, you ensure you are setting up the long range programs, not projects, programs, in which you commit to the young people, like I have done with Children First in Jamaica. I will die with you. I will never, ever, ever not be a member of your board unless you fire me. That is why Children First have achieved so much because every single one of us has said to them, we're not leaving. Here's my number, call me. Call me at midnight. Call me and tell me hers, cut the love making short I have problems. <laughs> young people keep, we keep saying, young people are hard to reach. Young people on the other side say, we don't know them. How is a person hard to reach if you don't even know them? They don't know you. Leave it one word. You understand the strategy. You cease fire. You redeploy. Because idle hands, not you? Huh? And you set up your long range programs of getting over the next five years your kids in school. Trust me, if this country embarks on this three-tier program, a program called Balance Reduction, and begin to sell to people that suppression alone doesn't work, suppression needs primary and secondary work, <coughs> we'll be good. And I leave with you a word, partnership. I'm tired of men and women competing. Gender versus masculinity is key. It is dumb. Men and women cannot compete with each other. I'm 17.2% bigger than you are. If you go into a physical fight, chances are 2.45 times I will win. See how I summarize domestic violence for you? If it is emotional intelligence, I will lose. <laughs> Hence, I tell men, don't get into an argument with women. Close your mouth. <laughs> but if we partner together, men and women, those of you with a few shillings and those who do not, those who are Catholics versus those who are Anglicans and Baptists, if we begin to work together as a society, we are going to produce a society that makes Nicaragua success look weak. Take care of yourselves. Judge, I bless you all. <laughs> Let us see you again. We are two Santi. Bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, there are two mics, one to my left and one to my lower right. If you guys don't want to move, we can come from where you are and bring a mic to you.
Exactly the same thing. Because what people do when they get into a suppression mode, anything they don't understand, they suppress. So rather than have a situation where you try to educate yourselves on a, on a topic, you just suppress it. It's basically widespread bigotry. All of it. Because we, the stuff we don't understand, we suppress. And I've often said to people, I'm a heterosexual male, but I've often said to people that, look, if somebody is different from the way I am, my intrigue is to understand what this person goes through. My first response can't be shut up. It's like the drama of people who buy a car, right? You are, this is the word they use in Jamaica, you are a butter food, you know that word? Meaning you walk every day, you have no car. And then you get some money, you buy a car. And you cost the people who are walking across the road that you did last <laughs> more than everybody else, right? <laughs> and I'm saying, it, it's back to this idea of harmony. I was working together. People who are different carry creativity. They carry, again, I go back to where I started. The human species does not allow us to be more than 87% homogeneous. 13% of people are always going to be different. If you oppress that 13%, you are going to find yourself in more problems. Clear? Question? Hey, good night. Thank you for that. I want to ask about something you said about um, violence and education. I think some of you were recommending that to help reduce violence, we should get more students to go further in school. Yes. But it's something to me, I don't see why that's not a, like an ice cream and jelly situation. Because where it's a third factor, because it's something, even from what you were saying, it sounded like it was more about the family support that led to people doing, going further in school. So then that would be the relevant factor rather than being in school. I don't see what the causative situation is. Beautiful. Thank you. People who have a, gray, a handful of grains per day are the healthiest people in the world. But it's not the grains that make them healthy. It's the attitude to want to have grains rather than a pound of chicken with hormones in it out. Huh? And a big piece of pork and a big piece of beef drop on the plate and just shake. So quite often, it's not necessarily, this is the point I was making, it's not necessarily the fact that these boys were in school. That alone doesn't cut it. What cuts it is that the boys who were able to do K had family. You get what I'm saying? They had family. They had families who were earning, who were working. And let me tell you a little trick about something. If every single body, I have taken the women who are in polyandry. That's a good example. They don't have family support. So while people are cussing them and calling them whores and calling them all kinds of horrible names, the point is that they had a family. They would not have to do that. Because if they could find 20 shillings out of the 50, the family would have sufficed with the other 30 shillings. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So it goes back to family, which is why it's always the primary. But the governments of the region must also have a policy that says, we will do everything in our capacity to keep our children in school. So when you are the exception to the rule, you happen to have family support, but you make the decision not to send your child to school, it becomes seen as a threat to the social order. And you are, by moral suasion or other sanctions, treated somewhat. So you get it in your skull that your child needs 
to be in school. I have seen parents on the road begging with their children. I understand, I empathize. But I also say to a state that allows that, that A, you should have had welfare for this mom. B, you should have educated her that is placed in school. And C, you should ensure the child is in school at all costs. For those countries like Jamaica that says, every child must learn. Every child, you know, you know those fancy tablets, right? And then at the end of the day, you have in some communities, listen, listen to the statistics. There are communities in Jamaica, in Belize, in Trinidad, in rich Trinidad. Trinidad, the richest country in the region. There are communities in which between 30 and 60% of boys between age 6 and 18 are out of school. If you have something as damning as that in your country, irrespective of any other factor, gangs have a massive pool waiting in line to be recruited. This is the only region I have worked in where gang leaders tell me I'm tired of the illiterate ones. <laughs> That's damning. A good man telling her he is tired, my brother, of illiterate gunmen in his arm, in his team. One said, I send the boy to shoot somebody in another house there. The boy can't read. The boy illiterate. The boy not numerate. The boy just, all him, all him is a, is a killy killy. I'm saying to you, the power of education. Every time there's a, there's a Ponzi scheme, look at who flood it. People who can barely read and write, who have a dream, who buy a lot of every day. I have to buy the lot because I want to get a bus out. You have the more you dream, the poorer you are, the more illiterate you are, the more you dream. As soon as you become a near poor, so the difference between near poor and poor. I grew up in a near poor situation. We thought we were poor until we looked around and realized people were, people were poverty and some deaths. Near poor people have just enough to make sure they have choices. What you want to do is to educate your masses. The problem you should be having as a country is brain sale. Please note, I did not say brain drain. Because if, if you grow up, get a first degree, find no job, end up in Canada where they are not appealing for people to come, you will send something home called remittance to your little brother called Wayne, who will then go to school rather than shoot people. Good night. Doc, um, you, said, you said we tick. The region tick. You use the word tick. I say what the DJs then say. That's how the thing set up. Talk a little bit about that. When I say, when I say that's how the thing set up, it is my belief that every crisis somebody is benefiting. Oh, yeah. Every oh. problem somebody will make a money. It's called the entrepreneurship yeah. so, so that's how the thing set up. Um, so so that's, the, that's the first thing. The, the second part, I want you to speak a bit about. In Nicaragua, who was the catalyst for the change? Was it the people telling the politicians we're tired of this? Or was it one or more politicians who wanted to be different? Who led that change? It's It's... Everything. So I start with the last, right? In Nicaragua, as far as I know, I've never worked in Nicaragua, so I can only tell you what I've heard from my Nicaraguan friends. NGOs, people on the ground, came together and began to say, we need a couple of people from government to sit with us. Did you know you don't even have a couple of MPs? You don't need them all of them enough. You just need two or three that have sense. Have sense and have a heart. Did you know that? You don't need a whole bunch. And I'm certain Belize you must can't find two and three. Why are we laughing? 
So, so you come up with your ideas and you find two and three and you, you begin to hammer into their heads. Worst of all in your case is your cousin. Because you're small. There's a, there's a lot of power in being small enough. In the same way you can call a politician and say, then check on my boy. Uh -huh. I am convinced we can come together as groups and say, let's change this. And if you lobby hard enough, and if you, if you speak loud enough and together, people will have to listen because you now create a new agenda. The new agenda is, I will vote for you if. We have far more power than we think we have. You clear? The conspiracy. People are making loads of money from violence. I tell you a little, I tell you a little secret. I have one national award in Jamaica. It came from a, the security firm. <laughs> the security firms in Jamaica came together and gave me, they call, they're called ASIS. Big chapter. They, my only national award is from security companies. Isn't that ironical? <laughs> hmm? Merit to Dr. Herbert Gale for helping keeping this country safe. <laughs> Remember that they benefit from the violence, right? Because 15% of your budget to keep a business afloat in the Caribbean is the security companies, right? Huh? It's 50 percent, yeah? It's a lot of money. So in other words, a lot of people benefit. And there are some people benefit when some people are crying. But, so we have to begin to teach everybody to come and go. Yeah? That's where the problem is. Yes? All right. You... I guess you get to say how Southside look, and you see they skate away there. Is there a way for, and in these, and in these communities you have artists, and artists you could substitute for unemployed people too. Right. So is there a way for the business community, along with the community, to create something long term, in terms of like murals, or for artists that perform, to have something where they beautify their own communities and to and to like like say for for example if we have this business and they have a wall so the graffiti artist is contracted to do this wall and every like every so often they change to someone else so that everyone gets a chance to to um to to do their thing or so is there a way to implement programs that are long term that could help the community as well as the business community and it, it, it's, it's like a, a three-prong direction with that. Yeah. Well, that's more a suggestion than a question. But, but in essence, anything at all that redeploys people from gang banging to something that is productive is always going to help save a community. But at the end of the day, remember there's a key test. There's a test you can you can level at the community to know if people are going to be killing each other. Go in there and ask the young men, what will you be doing in the next five years? If they have an answer, you're safe. If they don't have an answer, it's the same thing like suicide. When I worked for a suicide group in, in London, the core question I was trained to ask women who call in to say, I think I'm going to kill myself. I would ask, so what are you having for breakfast? Oh, you know, I plan to have some eggs. When well, you ain't gonna kill yourself. <laughs> in, in inner cities, if you can ask young people what they're gonna do in the next five years, it's a question we've been asking them. You can begin to separate those. Say, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, see, my friend dead, and uh, those persons have no ontological security. Some kids can only see next week. So I'm saying, I'm giving you a tool. Go into a community, you ask these basic questions, and you begin to separate and begin to, to give them a sense of something. Tell them into art, tell them into music, tell them into whatever. But at the same time, please remember everybody. If you take me from chicken back to chicken, make sure I'm not going back to chicken back. Somebody's going to feel it for me to eat chicken. <laughs> 
continuously. So in other words, again I go back to what I said to my kids and children first. I will be with you until I die. Be clear on that? Some of the most vicious animals I have worked with. We have one, we won't call his name, a lawyer took him under her wings, let him live in her posh house, adopted him, and then migrated to Canada. And he killed. That boy just killed left, right, and center because he says, he, neither he nor his two sisters and his little brother is going back to eat no chicken back and shake out. You understand? So anything at all you start, make sure you know it is sustainable. Make sure you take up just the amount you can manage. Be clear? Don't take up 10 projects and you can only manage one. Take the one, work with the one, and guarantee these young people ontological security. Are there more questions on the board? I liked your expl explanation with the polyamory. I think that's pretty on target. I think when, from my work experience, I think when I think about it, I always say they love differently and they love within their capacity. So what we look at and we could easily pass judgment on, you don't know the what shoes they're walking, you don't know the situation, they're doing the best they can. You spoke a little about the aspect of the unsupported mothers and then the boys being tortured. Now from my experience, when we do our PTSD self, um, we see various different forms of trauma. Based on the research, what specific types of trauma are being highlighted? All right, well, one of the first things is self-hate, as in the kids grow up not liking themselves. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you take the kids who've killed the most, right? I have a young one who's killed 17 people. By the way, he's 17 years old. It's not a nice note to end on because you have to go up and down. But he's 17 years old and he's killed 17 people. He has a scar on his face. When I met his mother, his mother said, and he all glazed in herbs, look at him. Herbs, stand up and angry and look at him. You know, look like a shark. <laughs> and by the way, the boy has a name that's related to animals. Caribbean has small space, won't call his name. He's always wanted. From 13 years old, he's been listening. So self-hate. <coughs> Hatred for everything called authority. And anybody who attempts to nurture with me so far, major damage. And it's one of the things that we've been trying to get to people. And that's why we've been trying to expose these kids. Get them into camps so they meet other people. Exposure, you understand? We had a boy who ran across the Mona campus, and this was the first time he was seeing grass. Jumped out of the bus. We went to the inner city and brought them to the campus. This was when you were in first year. Why I ran out, I said, go back, grass, grass! Because all he knew was sewage, and concrete. He dropped on the grass and he rolled. And you know what we did? We went for him and I whispered something in the ear of one of my colleagues and we made a decision. We sent him through. And by the way, he's now a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Can we have up in the church over here? Because we recognize he had never been to halfway tree. 51% of the young men in Montego Bay has never left their community. They can't go out because they are gang locked. They can't cross a road. 7% of those, there's another 7% who left, who attempted to leave and run back. Because when they try to go to another place, they see them enemy. You see the volume of work we have to do? Mm -hmm. But that's the biggest problem if we're finding. Hatred of everything that breeds. It's the biggest trauma impact we're seeing. Like literally. 
Most gang members I work with tell me I'm the first human being they like. <coughs> Isn't that sad? I have 278 repeat killers in my data set, and half of them tell me I'm the first human being who sat down with them, listened to their story, hugged them, drink a beer with them, huh? talked to them and said to them, it's not over yet because we're still here on earth. Half of them tell me in in being interviewed, they began to find the first thread of liking themselves. Well, if you can't like yourself, you can't like anybody else. All right? Final question? Oh. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so, in my little work that I try to do working with young people, I go to schools. Um, what I try to do is use sports as a hook to to move the process. So I would go to a school and say, principal, I want your rudest boy, your baddest boy, your, the real people never give all the trouble, boys mostly. And in many instances, I am seeing where these boys are also not doing good in school, but they are physically, because remember, I'm looking for sports. I'm looking for sports kids. So they, they have the physique that will make them good sports kids. From your expertise and knowledge, is there a correlation? And, and, and let, let, let me add this part. A majority of these kids, these boys, especially, who fit that description, when you talk to the teacher, the principal, or anybody, even the parents, the boy don't see. The boy can't learn. He, he, he's slow and those sort of stuff. Now, when I work with a majority of these kids, that not, that that are not the case where that's not the diagnosis. That's not the diagnosis. No. You know, but but is there a correlation with being they, they are really good quality young kids who will make good athletes, but for some reason the system is saying they can learn. Speak a little bit on that for me, please. Let, let me tell you. All right. So there is a there's a, a a thin percentage, a very small percentage of people who have mental disabilities, right? Clear? We understand that, all right? Let's put that group aside because that group needs its own care. Here's the problem that we're finding in a lot of schools. A child has, you see, when, when, when we're gradually getting there, some people learn, some people are auditors, some people are visual, right? And some of us think that there are only three things that people must learn, the three R's, right? When you, when I'm, I'm certain, Virginia, when you ask parents sometimes for to send the child to, be, to, to become part of the, the fine arts, what are this? Fine arts? What are this? You see, we are so colonial. You. But we are. We are, we are so old fashioned in our ideas. A girl said to me, my brother, I am looking for a man. I said, so what type of man you're looking for? He must be a doctor, a lawyer, whatever, and she's listing all of these things, you know, all in the three hours. So I said, what about the guy who I see always winking at you? He was an electrician. So you know something you fast. You go to the electrician and say, how much you earn per month? He said, I'm only like electrical business, you know. Per month, I worked out in Belize for you. I earned about five thousand Belize dollars per month. <laughs> oh, boom money that! <laughs> With boom money, you know, money I explode. Two thousand five hundred US per month, and I'm so smart in doing pay tax. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> The man is having a little thing and he's having a little good. Let off him a little card and you pass the card and say this guy is really good and he comes and he does his thing. Guess how much she earned? That's the drama. <laughs> Guess how much she earned? 2,000 million dollars per month. But she want doctor and lawyer, whatever. So it's what we sell our daughters and our sons, don't. 
What we sell our children, we sell to them that they must become lawyers and doctors and so forth. So when they come in class and you're there telling them, do you do that for you? with a boring self? <laughs> and they don't understand what you mean because they require you to manipulate things. So the teaching practices have to also augment, it has to change. But we also have to sell to the Belizean and the rest of the Caribbean the technical areas that they exist. Their sports. My daughter, and this was a shocker to me, my daughter was the anchor for her school challenge quiz team. She was a little whiz that anchored the whole team. And before his junior school challenge quiz starts on TV, J. Jamaica, the young people will say, the children will say, in the future, I hope to become a, and so forth. My daughter says, I hope to be a writer and composer. One woman blurt up behind me, what the big baby I'm fool. <laughs> oh, she right. I'm not a liar and doctor. Hey? Come what? Pose a, a pose, she have a pose. And you get the ignorance immediately. They've never heard, by the way, to get your child to become a composer is far more expensive than medicine. So I am worried. <laughs> But the poor woman don't understand these things because all they grow up with is the old methods. And it's something we have to bring our renaissance to the Caribbean. The University of the West Indies has been forced, let me say that again, they have been forced to bring in film, to bring in animation. You understand that? So they are bringing in stuff, and by the way, as soon as they brought in this stuff, the male population on the Mona campus has been going up. Because now you have stuff that a lot of young men understand. We can have some animation, we can do some photography, we can do some, photography, we can do some videography, we can do a short film, we can run a short film as far as to, to Sundance and to, to all kinds of festivals, and we can travel, and we can make money. They don't understand about. Uh, becoming a lawyer and a doctor. You need to read 200 books, you're mad. <laughs> so in other words, the entire region is not embracing the variety and the diversity that the human species have in every way, including, as my brother pointed out, in the area of sexuality. That's what we're stuck at. A very old, patriarchal, hegemonic, fufu city that says that this is how it's done, and this is your division of labor. That is why we have all these gender problems and all kinds of ideas, because we don't understand partnership and diversity. I hope I help. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for the contribution also in our country. Dr. Yale, before you leave, you talk, I think I want to leave for a few minutes, a few seconds. Real quick, we went to Dr. Yale. All right, I want to introduce you to somebody else who inspired me. Beside Gary Cross, eh? Gray shirt, beside the blue shirt. That's just Hermosa. Right, he taught me high school, right? I had between the two between a gun and creativity. He said creativity is magic. That guy doesn't know what he changed my life from deciding from using a gun in Port Loyola, right, for looking to art to make magic. That lady down here right there, sir, in pink, Mary Bastia. She taught me a genius. She does not know. She taught me a genius. She does not realize that when I was younger, they said that if you don't know if you do something other than art, you're stupid. She said I was as a genius. So Belize is making impact, Dr. Gill. So thank you guys so much for coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you.